Welcome back to our discussion on the systems which govern U.S. politics. We've discussed political incentive systems and the problems with election fundraising, which leads us nicely to our next election-related issue, gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is the process of redrawing the boundaries of political districts in order to be more favorable to you or your party. You see, originally, most districts were drawn based on geography or some vague idea of a shared community. A district would be defined by a neighborhood or a township or a set of rivers, but that's not the way it is today. Nobody could ever give a good formal definition of what a community or a geographic region actually was, so legally all that was really mandated for a congressional district was that a certain number of people be in it. And this system could potentially work, but then we gave the very people who were elected by these districts the power to redefine those district boundaries, with the only real rule being that each district contains the right number of people. You don't have to be a game designer to see how broken that system is. I mean, if you're a politician and you want to get re-elected, you're gonna redraw those district lines to swing things in your favor. You're gonna include that little township that you know you're popular in, and maybe cut out that suburb that opposed you so strongly last time around. And over time, this has led to some very ridiculous-looking districts. But here's the amazing thing. You know how sometimes players find an exploit in a game and start using it like crazy, not realizing it'll hurt them down the road? James was once called in to help fix an RPG where the players had found a way to skip some of the long and grindy dungeons, but then hours later found out that because they'd done that, they'd not learned the spell they needed to actually beat the rest of the game. And it turns out this is exactly what happened to our politicians. Why? Because systems in games don't exist in isolation, and it's the same with systems in our politics. You see, originally, when our districts more closely represented communities or geographic regions, they tended to be relatively balanced in terms of political opinions. Some leaned a bit to the left and others a bit to the right, but overall, you only rarely saw districts that were overwhelmingly partisan. This forced politicians to try and assemble a majority out of people with somewhat differing views, which tended to push them more towards the center of the political spectrum. Radical candidates on either side would tend to lose to opponents with opinions that better fit the majority of the district. But over time, politicians rewrote their district boundaries again and again, molding the districts into a stronger support base of voters. They'd bring in a few more people of their party, kick out a few of the other party, until finally, they didn't have to worry about re-election at all. Their district was almost guaranteed to vote for their party. So long as they were their party's candidate, they could sail to an easy victory. But there's the rub. You see, they used this exploit so much that soon the districts were completely locked up for one party or another. And all of a sudden, another interlocking system came into play. Primaries. Primaries decide who will actually appear on the ballot for a party. And normally, sitting politicians rarely have to worry about being beaten by an outsider in the primary, so they just become their party's default nominee. And as this was how it had always been, this was how politicians doing the gerrymandering assumed it would continue. But as politicians made their districts safer and safer bets, they also made them more and more ideologically based. And all of a sudden, it wasn't the general election they had to worry about losing, but the primaries. You see, as these districts became more and more ideologically rigid, they became more and more radical. And the most hardcore members of these districts found themselves grouped together in large enough numbers to sway the primaries. All of a sudden, politicians no longer needed to be moderate enough to win a general election, but rather had to be extreme enough and rigid enough to keep themselves from losing to challengers who espoused an even more hardcore version of their philosophy in the primaries. All because they had shaped their district around people who supported that philosophy. The moderate candidates who thought they were doing themselves a favor and gaming the system by making those gerrymandered districts suddenly found themselves having to support positions that they didn't believe in if they wanted to be re-elected, even positions that didn't seem practical or reasonable. They also found that compromising with people across the aisle was suddenly political suicide, even if those people were old friends who they'd been working with for years. And no one could put the genie back in the bottle. As political stances became more extreme, the people who were winning the elections now controlled how districts were drawn, and they weren't going to start drawing less extreme districts. And that's a big part of how we ended up with our uncompromising, gridlocked Congress of today. Both parties do it. It's always terrible. We need to stop it. Gerrymandering is a system with consequences that utterly break democracy. But we can fix it by saying that a district has to be a geographic region. We simply split the U.S. into normal squares of varying sizes to get the number of people we need per district and say that no more than one district per state can be anything other than a perfect square. Or better still, simply take away the power to rewrite districts from the politicians and give it to some other independent government body whose job it is to try and create sensible district lines. But since we're talking about systems that don't keep the interlocking gears of government from grinding to a halt, we have to talk about filibustering. All a filibuster is, is a way to stop a law from being passed even if the majority of the people in the Senate want to vote for it. If you've ever seen Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, then you understand why we have this rule. It keeps the majority from just pushing through everything they want, and allows individuals a way to oppose actions they find completely unacceptable. But filibustering was supposed to be your sort of senatorial super move. It was something you cracked out when all dialogue had broken down, and every other attempt at sorting things out had failed to work. 
and like any good super move, it was hard to execute. Originally, in order to stop an appointment or a law by filibuster, you had to get up on the floor of the Senate and just start talking and refuse to yield your time until people were willing to acknowledge your position. It was, in its own way, an act of courage and fortitude, standing up there on your own without sleep or food, knowing that the moment you stopped, the second you paused, the thing you wanted to prevent would become law. But since its inception, it's become easier and easier to filibuster. You no longer have to stand and speak for days. Heck, you don't even have to speak. You can just declare that you are filibustering and delay a law forever. The super move is now macroed to the X button. And when your super move just takes one button press, why would you ever do anything else? As game designers, that's the very reason we make the super moves hard to execute. And just like in a game, when the most powerful move becomes easy to do, Congress people started doing it more and more. Here's a graph of the use of the filibuster over time. As you can see, it has gotten completely out of hand. Of course our Congress can't get stuff done when anyone who objects anything can delay whatever they want forever. That is broken. That is a busted system. No one making games would ever allow something that silly, and yet, it's how we run our country. Changes are being made to this law, and the dam is starting to crack, but even now the system is still busted. There's a lot more that needs to be done to rationalize this filibuster and make it make sense for a functional government. But still, despite all the stuff we've talked about, I have great hope for the future. Even though we've listed here just a few of the myriad ways that the systems that run our government are all out of alignment, the great thing about the form of government we've adopted is that it's flexible. We have the power to change it. Our discussion here has been a shorthand, an inexcusably brief summary of these issues, but we work with what we've got, and what we've got is a six-minute video on the internet. I hope we've managed to stir some ideas and create discussion, though. But more than anything, I hope you've come to realize that you are the players in this great game, that you can move the pieces, and no matter how small your part, you can help to ensure that the rules are rewritten. That's the beauty of democracy. We can change it. Enjoy your holiday, and we'll see you in the new year.